So, yeah, I'd like to acknowledge the Indigenous um, elders of the land across the nation that we're um, broadcasting from. I'm on Wiradjuri land. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm um, using Zoom um, as a format. And Zoom's recently been um, publicly saying they work directly with the intelligence community, the American intelligence community, and also working with the Chinese um, government to censor dissidents. So I uh, just want to acknowledge that we're not on the ideal platform. Um, but the thing with tech, and we'll be talking about this a bit, is that, you know, there's not always an easy answer to these things. Um, and so we sort of do the best we can sometimes and depending on what context we're using things. So um, yeah, we'll talk about video a little bit later. Um, so people who haven't used Zoom before, there's a chat um, button down the bottom there. And I've shared the run sheet on that chat. I might just share it again in case the new people don't have that. Now, I'm really keen for the first part of the session um, to be actually discussing uh, issues that you're interested in. Um, normally I have a very tight run sheet with these sort of webinars um, and I have a lot of resources on this so I can revert back to more of a tight run sheet format. Um, however, I'd be really keen to sort of see what, you know, what questions you are, where you're coming from, um, things that you would like to be um, more interested in discussing. Um, and I also want to note that this webinar is more aimed at um, sort of non-technical people. So a lot of the more technical concepts I'm going to breeze over um, because, you know, I don't really want this to be a talk about mathematical encryption and things like that. Um, because, you know, there's other formats for that um, or maybe we can talk about that a bit more in the uh, FAQ. Uh, and also, I'm actually not a computer scientist. Uh, I'm a graphic designer by background, so I'm, I'm the wrong person to be talking about mathematical encryption. Um, and I'll just explain a bit where, where I'm coming from with this as well. Um, so I'm just going to drop back to the run sheet. And I've, I've dumped some, some rough notes at the bottom. Uh, hang on, that's the wrong run sheet. And I'm just admitting people. So yeah, um, around about 2016, um, 2015, the the activist scene. I was working with a lot of non-violent direct action people, and there's just no respect of security. Pretty much, the most that people thought about security is they'd use old Nokia phones because they had this idea that um, the Nokia phones didn't have the internet and therefore couldn't be spied upon, um, which is not so cool because the the phone and SMS system was designed to be wiretapped from the day it was designed way back to the telegram days. Um, so that was as far as the, the you know, the respect for um, digital security in, in the activist scene that I was working with, except for a group of people that were working in say West Papua, where if you leak details, someone got tortured and someone got killed. So you'll find that when activists are working in a context where people get killed, they care about this. But in Australia, no one cares. Um, so I was really concerned by that. And um, uh, we're also at the lead blockade. Um, so you may have heard of Frontline Action on Coal. We're blockading a coal mine there. And at that time, the New South Wales Police, uh, WikiLeaks released that they were buying Fin Spy software. And what that's used is for hacking computers, basically for state to state hacking for um, intelligence gathering. We also uncovered um, corporate spies actually came to camp. Um, so if you watch the Black Hole uh, documentary, there's a great section on actually outing those spies. And um, so this was all happening at the time. And also uh, then Snowden got released. Um, and for those who don't know who Snowden, in, Snowden is, he was a high level operative in the um, intelligence community in America. And he leaked a whole bunch of um, uh, information that really informs what we know about the spy infrastructure. And so this is, I'll be talking a bit about that today because most of what we're talking about here, we're sort of um, getting from bits and pieces um, here and there. Um, 
and at, also as far as with Snowden, then the Australian government is also upskilling, uh, if you have a look at budgets, just massive increase in ASIO and other spy agencies. So I was like, this is crazy. So um, I did a heap of work. I got um, some actual security technologists. We did some research. Um, I found that all the guides online were just not relevant. They were either talking about mathematical encryption or they just weren't relevant to on the ground tech. So we built some guides. So the 2016 one I'll refer to today. Um, and that was talking about not tech, but concepts around security, because a lot of this isn't about technology, it's about people. And uh, then we got together a group of tools. Um, and then at that time I was, um, I was moving off the blockade camps to start working on frontline action on coal to actually work on a remote collaborative system. So the idea was to allow city people to be able to do some of the core work that a blockade camp does that shouldn't be doing, you know, moderating Facebook, um, doing a lot of the, the fundraising stuff, um, you know, writing letters, all that sort of stuff that, you know, just not appropriate in, in the tough conditions of the camp. So I, um, we started using these tools. We were very strict on our encryption. Basically you couldn't use the, you couldn't join our system unless you were using a proton email. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and we're very successful in actually adapting that organization to be using encrypted communications. And we had a lot of problems because a lot of this tech doesn't work in the real world. Um, a lot of this tech won't work in remote Queensland or remote New South Wales. Or a lot of this tech won't work when you've got people with very low computer literacy or when people have got dodgy computers and stuff like that. So this is where I really want to come from is that um, the systems I'm going to talk about are actually be, we're deploying them in Australia with people using them from all, all walks of life. Um, and some stuff is yeah, a bit harder. Um, and so I'll talk about stuff that's hard. So if you're really scared of this stuff, maybe you might not do that step first, but there's a lot of stuff that I'm going to talk about is really, really easy. If you can install an app, you can install signal, for example. And so I, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be talking about some really simple stuff that you can do. Um, and also talk about some of the concepts that I've been um, having issues with as far as people's ideas about technology and also some of my ideas. So yeah, the uh, chat is down here. Um, so um, yeah, could, could people please add to the um, chat, like what's stopping you from embracing encryp encryption or more secure ways? Like what, 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 why, why, aren't you, uh, why aren't you running this webinar? That you know, you've done that work um, and, you, and you know how to roll. Um, so it would be really interesting to see what's stopping people because then I can talk about some of that stuff. Um, and one of the concepts that I'm, I'm going to talk to in a fair bit of detail um, is that the spying on us anyway, why should I care? I hear that all the time. Um, and that's also linked to I'm not doing anything wrong, so why should I care? So um, I'm going to talk about that in, in a fair bit of detail and a fair bit of pieces because I think the answer to that is actually um, quite complicated. Um, so Julie is saying uh, lazy and in, in a insufficient research into what's available. So that's exactly, um, I've got a in my resources somewhere, the barriers to entry and that's exactly it. I'm glad you actually said laziness because um, please don't be ashamed by saying that because um, I find that most barriers are people um, are being lazy, but not just lazy. It's just really, um, it's, it, it can seem complicated and it will take some work. So I'm not saying that it's just gonna be magic. Like for example, password manager. My, my friend uh, adopted a password manager, but then, um, which only is like a few minutes work, but then her mess of her digital passwords was such a mess, it took her days to filter that. And so she was like, that's a pain. And I'm like, yeah, but that's because it's your mess, not because of the thing. Um, seems too big and hard anyway. So the last part of this um, webinar is going to be, I've got a list of tools and I'm gonna go through them. And as I said, a lot of these tools are um, accessible. If you can use SMS, if you can use um, various tools, you'll be able to use these tools. Um, the big challenge you will have is getting your collaborators and the people you work with to use these tools. Hence why I'm trying to you know, do these sort of webinars. 
so that um, we're getting more people um, using these tools. And so the great thing about when I did the work with the lead is that the, the frontline action has a lot of activists that come and go. And so I would then go to another activist event and everyone's using Proton Mail and everyone's using Signal and I'm like, yay, well done. Because I know that that's now spreading. And because it is as, as easy as using a non-alternative, like why wouldn't you use it? Um, and Valerie's mentioned um, half-bake attempts. Yeah, I get that. It sometimes, it can be hard. And the other thing is that the technology is getting better. So like if you gave this a good go two years ago, a lot of technology wasn't quite working very nicely and you might have gone, this sucks. Whereas now there, there may be a tool that works really well for you. So, um, and also I'm not sure what, what I'm doing. Well, that's great, you're in the right place because we're gonna talk about that um, and hopefully get some introduction. So yeah, keep the questions going. As I said, I'm gonna freestyle. Um, and if there's no questions, I'm going to jump back to just some of the content that I've got because I've, I've done these sort of structured trainings um, in more of a structured way. Uh, I leave home security to my partner. Um, yep, so if, you're part, if you've got uh, you know, a partner that's um, willing to help you and manage that stuff, that's fine. Um, but I think everyone just needs a base level. Um, you know, using details and stuff like that. Um, Shay's written, um, PGP, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. That's an email encryption. Um, it's very hard and complex to set up. Um, basically, it's an email encrypted system. It's the best practice. Um, and it's very hard. I struggle with it. And Shay, I know Shay's um, a technologist. Um, he struggled with it. Um, and then no one else is using it. So then Proton Mail came out and it's 500 megs for free. And Proton Mail to Proton Mail is encrypted. So it's now easy. Um, so that's what I mean. Within two years, we had something that was technically really hard for technical people. So therefore, there's no way, you know, a non-technical person is going to manage it. And I don't trust that, that, that they got it right anyway. So I just don't trust the system. Versus now we can just sign up to a system that's very easy. Um, okay, so I'm just going to talk about like, they are spying on me anyway. Why should I care? Because they're spying on me anyway. I hear that all the time. Um, or I'm not doing anything wrong, so I shouldn't care. So I'm first going to um, introduce to the five eyes. Um, hang on, let me just pull that up from Wikipedia. Um, I've got the link on that run sheet. Um, I just didn't hyperlink it. So the five eyes is basically um, an intelligence sharing arrangement between five countries, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, United Kingdom and United States. Now I'm just, that's complex. You can go, go do your own research. Um, and as I said, I'm just gonna gloss over a lot of these concepts. But what I want you to understand with the five eyes is that it's, it's illegal for Australia, under Australian law, the state to spy on Australian citizens. It's illegal in the US, United States for the state to spy on American citizens. So what they do is New Zealand spies on Australia and UK spies on America and America spies on the UK and then they share the data. So it's legal, but it's sort of not and they're sort of doing it and they've been doing it for many years. Um, so in the short answer is yes, they are spying on everything. Um, pretty much they're hoovering up all data that goes through all, all the links into the in and out of the country, the cables, they're also all the satellite comms, all of that. Um, there's also now extended um, relationships. So there's like 14 eyes and seven eyes and blah, blah, blah. So this, this infrastructure is getting bigger and more intense. Um, however, okay, I'm just jump back to my notes. However, uh, sorry, um, I want to also mention um, a guy called Christopher John Boyce. Now, if you look up, I've got the Wikipedia link. Um, there's a great book called The Falcon and the Snowman. And it's a true story about two childhood friends. One became a cocaine um, smuggler dealer and one became an intelligence operator. And in the court case, oh, basically they both shared intelligence to the Russians. It was a major um, uh, spy case um, back in the day. And in court, um, Christopher, said on public record, the reason that he um, became a traitor to the United States is that he was pissed off about how the ally, how US treated its allies in the Five Eyes Agreement, i.e. 
the way that Australia would be giving the US all their data and the US would not give the data back. That was said in court. Specifically, the US not co um, cooperating with the Australian. Um, so we know that that's, that's all, there's a lot dodgy in there, like the relationships aren't as smooth as they like to pretend. And then of course, Snowden, which released a whole heap of stuff. So we do know a fair bit about these infrastructures and what they're doing. Um, now, the issue, um, oh, where did that go off? My, oh yeah, so they also have relationships with the big tech companies. So, um, oh, sorry, I didn't add this to the um, run sheet. I'll add this afterwards. There's an organization, the CIA originally, uh, back in uh, many years ago, instead of them developing spy technology, they decided to set up an investment arm. Um, and this is all public on Wikipedia or whatever. And so then they started investing in technology companies. Um, they've got investments in Facebook, for example. Um, so anything that's really um, a sophisticated search company or um, certain um, national security um, companies, they just nationalize. So it's interesting that capitalists will just nationalize um, under intelligence um, directives. So they do um, start eating up tech companies or they just have shareholdings in tech companies. So we've also got this um, relationship with states, but then also the, the tech companies themselves. So in that case, yes, they are spying on everything. However, I also say, no, they're not spying on everything. And here's why. The, the infrastructure that I just talked about is the top elite spy agency, spy agencies. Um, these are mysterious, secret, non existent as they'd like to be agencies. Um, and they're unlinked completely to what we know as law enforcement. They're not linked to the Victorian police. They're not linked to um, the federal police. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One is it's an illegal program and what they do is illegal and there's, there's so much documentation of them just not following the law. So they don't actually want to cl collaborate with other law enforcements. Um, they, it's a bit like if, if you use your power too much, then they'll take it away. So they keep the powers they have tight amongst themselves for whatever reason that they're doing with it. So to say that the Victorian police uh, have access to all this infrastructure is not so cool. They just don't. Um, so if your main issue is if you're the lead blockade and it's the Victorian police that are um, targeting you, all of what I've just said about the five A's is not relevant to you. Um, and then when the federal police come in, it's still not relevant. Um, and generally, um, the, the high level echelon just don't care about us and protesting in the forest about a call. call. The other issue that we have is technical. So there's that much data that how do you filter and how do you find patterns? This is why the intelligence community is really interested in search technologies because that's, that's, the, that's the game. Um, so there's so much data, um, finding it is, is the issue. Um, there's also turf wars and politics within these organizations. Um, you think about all these really ego based men that are in charge of these organizations. Um, yeah. So there are issues between them or cooperating and stuff. Um, and it's also interesting and, um, it's a really horrible subject, but I'm going to talk about, um, pedophilia and child sex protection in this because it's usually what the government will say when they want to bring in dodgy laws. But here's what I'm going to say back to the government. Why aren't you using this infrastructure to protect children? When have you heard in the media of the five eyes, the top spy echelon being used to protect children? Never, because they don't do that. That's not what they do. So um, that'd be my expectation of this system as a priority. Um, however, that's simply not what I do. So we know that um, there's certain things that they target and not target. Um, okay, so in the comments, um, feel already trapped, invested in Gmail, Facebook. Yep, um, so am I. And I'll talk a little bit about um, getting off Gmail, definitely. Um, and also Facebook, um, yeah, it would be good to have a bit of a discussion a bit later about Facebook. Um, it's a tool that's sort of now a default and we need to use it. Um, ironically, me and Shay are on a, um, techno uh, like a Facebook group that talks about digital security. Um, the irony, the irony. So um, it is a tool to use, but then um, there is also ways to minimize um, the impact on that. And I also do want to mention that um, 
Facebook is to me the ultimate spy machine. Um, but you know, TikTok's now um, in the game, and they're gonna they um, the Chinese have given it a good good red hot go. Um, so back to the yes, they are spying us anyway. I want to talk about the new uh, the not new two couple of years old now the Australian data retention laws. So basically, the government said right, all the telecommunication companies have to now spy on you because they're outsourcing the cost. Um, so basically what they're doing is they're containing metadata. So when you send an email, you've got the message, but then you've got what's called metadata. So it's my name and then I'm sending it, say to Julia, and uh, the time was sent. So that information is super useful because what happens if I'm sending an email, say to an abortion clinic? Um, you know, the email content has a, has um, a, a useful intelligence, but the fact that I'm emailing to an abortion clinic um, at certain times and dates, and then maybe that then correlates with um, my location data, um, you know, you can build up a pretty strong picture. Um, and so basically that then the law enforcement in Australia can access that without a warrant. So they are, the government wants the Telstra and, and um, Optus and MBN to track everybody's internet connection, um, the metadata for two years, and that they can access it without warrant. Now, the good news about this is that the tech companies didn't want to do this, and the government's not really good at managing tech, so they did implement this, but in a very dodgy, in a very you know not very good way. So you can simply overcome that with a VPN and I'll talk about VPNs in a bit, and you can overcome that by not using traditional communications such as SMS and phone, and I'll talk about that as well. Um, so yes, the Australian government is spying on everything, um, but you can overcome that. Um, private companies spy on activists for mining companies. Um, that is true, and there's a lot of evidence. Um, they've had physical spies, um, but I would assume that a company like Adani would be um, also doing um, digital spying. We can defend ourselves against it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not as hard as defending against the NSA. So the point that Shay's making there is if you're being targeted by the elite um, um, Australian intelligence community, or the elite Russian or American intelligence community, you're, you're unlikely to be able to defend yourself because the skills and technology and the resources to the state. But that's, it's really unlikely that they're gonna be targeting you. Um, but if you're talking about Adani that's hiring a private spy to say, um, to get data on you, then that is far um, more realistic and you can defend against these sort of things. Um, so that's why it's really important to think about, um, you know, who's targeting you um, or what your potential risks are. Because, you know, if you just default to, oh, they're spying on us anyway, you just make it then easy for the um, private corporation just to hire a spy and then get your information. Because they weren't able to get that through through the ASIO because ASIO is not going to give them that data. Just no way. Um, so, yeah, always think about that in that context. Like even a tiny little bit of security goes a really long way. Um, yeah, and if you are actually um, a target of the elite, um, you know, intelligence community, you know, then you would need to learn some some high end skills. But we're not going through that in this webinar. That's obviously for the Snowden type people. All right. So my my definition of encryption is that you've got a message, and then there's some really complex mathematics that the secure, and then you get the message at the other end. Um, or you've got a file and you've got complex mathematics that wraps it up in security. That's all we need to know. So I'm not going to talk about mathematical algorithms. I'm not going to go into the complexities. Like you can do that in your own time. The concept is that um, encryption works. And that's all we really need to know for this, this webinar and to keep going. And I can say encryption works for a few reasons. One, Snowden. So Snowden released a whole heap of documents and they, some of the documents that he released was stuff that they couldn't access. So the top level of the top echelon of the American intelligence community couldn't access a lot of data that was encrypted. So we know that. We also know a court case, um, FBI versus Apple. 
So the FBI was um, investigating um, criminal activity and they said to Apple, right, we want the messages off these phones. And the Apple said, well, you can't do that. Um, and so therefore they went to court and Apple won that case. Um, so we know that the FBI at that point couldn't get into the phones. And the other thing that I'm um, going to point to, and I'm gonna to talk to you a bit next, is the new Australian encryption laws. Now they wouldn't be bringing these laws in if they could crack it. Um, and I'm gonna talk a, a, about a lot of the flaws and um, sort of the complexities around that in a little bit. Um, but they wouldn't be doing that if, if they could access it because really what they wanna do is an ideal situation for law enforcement is they can access it. People don't know they can access it and it's all quiet, no one talks about it. But people are talking about it and um, we know that they can't access it. Uh, also, if you're using encrypted communications and they get a warrant and hypothetically, if they could access them, they can only target what data exists. So if you're deleting data and you've got good data hygiene, so you should be thinking about how long do I keep this data? How long are these messages relevant? So do you really need a message from six months ago? So even if they access that data, if they've only got the last week's data of your messages, they can't access the last six months. So that's an important point. And also if they don't know about data, they can't, act, they can't target it or warrant can't target data they don't know about. So if you're using multiple channels and um, using multiple technologies and you're um, applying security protocol, they won't even know that they've got these um, various, um, hang on, I'm just leaving some of them. They won't know that you've actually got that data or what they're targeting. A lot of police will actually go roughly, oh, this person's of interest. We're just going to grab the data and see what we can find. I mean, a lot of um, policing is phishing um, and they don't even know what they're, what they're looking for. So if you've got stuff, um, if you're following good process, then they're not going to find it. And I also want to make a point that corporations have less power than the state. And, you know, sometimes we think that, you know, with the rise of the corporations, um, how powerful they are. But um, as far as laws, um, you know, the state um, has a far more power as far as laws um, and targeting people with um, security and that sort of stuff. Um, and the people have just joined recently. Um, we've um, talking um, about the current laws and why should, why should we care? Um, some people say they're spying on us anyway, so why should we care? So if you want to put in the chat um, any comments about that, any questions or anything that's stopping you from using security, um, we're just having a freestyling conversation. Um, and we'll also break at 11 for a 10 minute break as well. Um, all right, so I want to talk a little bit about the new encryption laws that have come into Australia. Um, and so under an article I've got here, under Australian legislation, police can force companies to create a technical function that would give them access to encrypted messages without the user's knowledge. They also say that law offers a safeguard which says decryptions won't go ahead if they create a systematic weakness. So the law is saying companies have to give them access to encrypted messages. However, they can't create a systematic weakness. Now that's really interesting because it's mathematically impossible. And the Australia, this representatives of the Australian government have actually gone on public record and said that Australian law overrides the laws of mathematics. So it's a little bit like their mining policy. They're just, they're, they're being nonsical. Um, so we've got this, this really interesting state of play now. The Australian government have brought in mathematically impossible laws and then they're gonna try and um, make them work. Um, now I'd normally say watch this space, but the problem we've got is that um, some of the subsections of the law are saying that the, the people that they target can't say anything. So they may go to one individual in a company and say, you need to now work for us. And if they, if they mention that to anyone, then they get fined and da da da. Now, I also want to talk a little bit like why I think that these laws have come out in Australia. So back to the Five Eyes program that I was discussing earlier. Um, that whole system has issues with encryption. Um, and again, reference and that's noted. So what they've done, um, in my opinion and, and a few other experts' opinion, is that they've gone, we need to crack the system globally across the Five Eyes network. So they've looked at what has got the weakest legislation in the world. Um, 
the Americans have the Bill of Rights um, to protect them. They talk about it all the time. Now, Australia has the weakest laws in the world. Now, we also have, you know, some pretty lame politicians. So, in my opinion, they've targeted Australia as the weakest point in the five eyes to bring in this legislation. It's also a small economy. So, for example, America and in, in the UK, they'll be like, let's just, let's just test it on Australia's economy, like, ha, ha rather than testing it on Silicon Valley. Um, so the idea is that once, if they can get this to work in Australia, then they will just bring the legislation in across the world, or they will use the five eyes to issue a warrant in Australia to then target someone in America or, or whatever. So I do think that Australia is in the center of the entire global intelligence community for this specific encryption law. Um, now, the other thing that's coming to play is it's a game of power, the state versus tech. Um, so I mentioned the FBI versus Apple case. So Google, as evil as they are, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit, are also um, not completely evil in the fact that they'll push back to the state. Apple, again, bad, they're dodgy values, but they are pushing back to the state against the state. So there is this power struggle between the tech and the state because the tech industry does have a lot of power. Then you've got other independent technology companies that just will refuse to um, comply. Um, and it was interesting in the um, file sharing community um, a few years back when the government brought in laws in the US to access, the, access secret documents, they just shut their systems down. So they have seen in the US where tech companies have shut down rather than comply to law. So this is really problematic for uh, an economic context of the state. So um, I'll leave it at that. Um, because you know there's a whole webinar on that and we'd probably get smarter people in than me to talk about that but i just want to talk about one concept to think about my opinion is that what they will target is your operating system rather so for example signal for them to try and target this company that that is vehemently anti-state it's just going to be a massive, massive uphill battle. But then they've got to hit Signal and then WhatsApp and then they've got to, you know, all these, and then all these different companies are coming up. If they can access your keyboard or they can access your microphone um, through your OS, then it doesn't matter about encrypting any software. So in my opinion, the main um, target for this software is the, the devices. And it's interesting back to Apple um, because then Apple isn't complying with the state. Um, Android is open source. So um, there are some protections there. So it's what we really need to see is if the government's doing stuff around this, we need to wait for a leak. So hopefully someone will leak so we can see what they're actually doing. Um, but we do know on BlackRock, um, I ran a workshop a couple of years ago at Students of Sustainability Festival, and we had the tech manager, um, one of the tech managers of BlackRock City. Um, not, yeah, BlackRock with the uh, um, Standing Rock, sorry, Standing Rock, where the, um, they were fighting for the pipeline. And basically what was happening is the government was shooting um, operating system updates through what we call a Stingray. So Stingray is a piece of technology that spoofs a Wi-Fi tower. So your phone will then um, connect to the Wi-Fi tower and it's not the actual proper, it goes through the government, through, through that device. And then they were sending fake updates to the operating system. And then we're, allowed, we're able to hack the phones that way. So they pretty much said no operating system updates while you're in the vicinity. So for me, that's what I'm sort of seeing how this, this will be deployed is that they'll be targeting individuals um, and they'll be going for the operating system. Now, the problem is you can't not update your phone because that's a real security flaw anyway. Um, but what it means is that they're unlikely to be able to mass surveil people. So what will likely happen, I'm just totally guessing, is that they will target individuals, they will um, do fake updates and take control of the phone, and then, um, then um, they can then access signal and all that. Um, now, I do think that we will get whistleblowers because there's so many people that are in encryption that are in it for you know, freedom of, um, and other reasons, and it's likely we'll get a leak somewhere along the line. Or I'll leave it at that unless there's any questions. Um, okay, so there's some questions up here. Um, COVID safe app. Why is the government not using the Google Apple platform? They seem to be actively resisting it. Um, we've got no facts on this. Um, 
my opinion is that it's dodgy. Um, they were using a lot of compliance techniques to get people to load it, but they've never used the data. Um, I think, um, in a personal opinion, that this was a Trojan horse. Um, we've got no evidence either way. Um, we've got a lot of evidence of um, geeks deconstructing that software and pretty much saying it didn't work and it was, it was crap. We have no evidence that it was used um, as, a, as a tracker or a spy. Um, I'm cynical, especially around the laws we just discussed. Um, at, at the moment, I, that's an, an opinion. Um, now, as far as the Google Apple platform, um, I have a slight a bit more trust for Google and Apple than the government, not a lot more. Um, and why are they not using that? I can't say. Again, um, I either ha haven't done the research or there's just not a lot of information out there. Um, and I think it's a huge public travesty because, um, you know, a tracking app in theory, what they're saying is a really good idea and it can be built with security. Um, I watched an interview with Snowden. He said, look, it'll take two days to get some security experts to write an app that protects people's security and does its job. So at that point, then I would be promoting everyone to download it because it's for the public um, health interest. Um, we can do this, um, but what we got given was not a secure, was, was not that. Um, so therefore I'm like, don't install the app. Um, fast mail, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't um, looked at that. Um, I did, so I can go through how I would research that, um, at the FAQ. So if you bring that, um, if you bring that um, question up, I can then come back and I can talk about um, like how I'd research and figure that out as a non-technical person. Um, my, my impression is that the government doesn't like the fact that data from Google Apple is distributed, not centralized as is in their present system. Yeah, I mean, as far as distribution, I'd also think it should, it should be um, uh, anonymized um, so that they can send, they can send, um, so if I, if I come positive, I can, they send me a message, go, you're positive, press the button, and then that pushes messages to everyone else that um, has been infected. Now I'm going to do that because like, you know, I installed it in the first place to do this. So um, it can be done. Um, and then anonymous data get, does get sent back to the central database because then it, then they can, it helps them, you know, track it and do all that stuff. So it, it can be done. Totally can be done. Um, anyway, that's, and I trust Snowden and that's what Snowden said. Anyway. Um, and I also want to talk about another concept about, you know, they're spying on me anyway. Um, is that I want to use an analogy of finding a needle in a haystack. So it's pretty hard. However, if you've got an x-ray machine and you know the new drones now, I've got thermal imaging and all the things like that, you find that needle really easy. So then we go, well, we've got this encryption, which is like a little lead sleeve. So put the needle in the lead sleeve and we put that in the, um, in the a haystack with a few other little um, sleeves, a few other people using it. And they pretty much can find five sleeves and they can target them. And then out of the five, they can find the needle. Now, if you've got the haystack where 60% of that haystack has got um, sleeves around all the straw, how are they going to find the needle? We're back to a needle and haystack. So encryption works far better on scale. So if you believe that the government shouldn't automatically spy on you, then you should use encryption. If you support more activists, the more radical than you, you're like, that's not where I'm at, but good on them. You know, nonviolent direct action, for example, street protest, then you should, you should use it to talk to your mum about getting milk from the shop. Um, if you disagree with the state surveillance, the laws, the corporate surveillance, all the things, if you believe in freedom, then you should use encryption. Um, if you believe in a state surveillance state, then sure, leave it as default. Um, stories about how police and private intelligence. Um, stories about police and private intelligence companies. I haven't done a huge amount of um, research on that, um, um, except for just my experience at the lead. So I recommend watching Black Hole documentary if you do a search for that, Black Hole. Um, also, if you look up flickruby.com, I'll just pull that up and put on the chat. Uh, Felicity Ruby. Now, this is an amazing woman, um, a bit of a hero of mine in, in the context. She um, used to be Scott Ludland's political advisor, so she was one of the brains behind Scott, and Scott was 
the only senator that understood tech and that was actually challenging tech in the Australian Parliament. So it was a huge loss to Australia to have lost um, the alleged New Zealand citizen. Um, so Felicity is doing her PhD on the five eyes and she's also discussing specifically about protest and spying on protest. Um, and she was doing case studies, for example, when we were at Pine Gap protesting the Five Eyes um, stuff a few years back. Um, so watch that space. She's a highly intelligent um, um, human and she's, she's doing a heap of research in this. So um, yeah, check her work, keep an eye on her. Um, she's active on Twitter. Um, okay, so do we have any questions? I'm going to um, jump um, to my course that I did. Um, where did that go? I lost it. Um, here it is, here it is. So digital security, um, so I put this course together because um, no one's taking it seriously and I was running workshops based on this. Um, in the 1980s, Vic Pol spied on activist groups and individuals. Um, yeah, um, the other thing as well is that the ABC released, uh, I can't remember what it was called, um, but it was a documentary, it was a few parts about um, state spying. Um, and there was one, one um, episode where ASIO and the federal police were spying on student activists. And it was just gross. You had these really old white men literally spying on young children, like making out in the car park. It was just really gross. Um, and they're doing yeah, like heaps of really gross stuff. Um, and I also, I honestly believe that the, the socialist community in, in Australia is heavily infl um, inf infiltrated. And I say that because if we go back to ASIO, and again, you can look up where ASIO came from, nuclear testing in the, in the um, South Australia. So we had British doing nuclear testing in Australia. And basically America was like, we don't trust Australia, there's too many socialists about. Um, we're really scared that the secret's going to leak through Australia. Now, ironically, their head of security, uh, sorry, head of safety in the nuclear program was a Russian spy and had access to areas. Um, but so they um, said, we need to set up an intelligence agency. So basically, ASIO was set up, you know, as an Australian org, but, you know, it's obvious it was a, a division of the CIA. And one of their main targets was this, well, main target was the um, Communist Party at the time. And they put huge resources in undermining and um, keeping tax on the Communist Party. Um, and that's just evolved through history. So we know that even at the start that that was the main target and I don't think that's changed. And I also can say that by some of the behavior of some of the socialist groups of just really being very disruptive to, um, to um, community organising, to mass scale organising and stuff like that. And um, I'd say that with like I'm pro-socialist pro as far as the politics and a lot of the people, I'm just saying that I believe that there are some people in there that um, are there for the wrong reasons. Um, also interested in legal use of data and that is unethical. Okay, so we did um, some webinars on, on actual data, um, databases um, on the webinar. So, um, there was also a talk at, um, so Digital, Digital Rights Australia is a new org that's set up to talk about this sort of stuff. Hey, I'm just getting the webinar up. Um, and so they did a great talk at the last progress, which was like last week or a couple of weeks ago. So hopefully they released those videos. Um, and they were talking about this data um, privacy and ethical use of data, like hallelujah, because we've been saying this for like years and everyone's ignoring us. And so it's really great to see progress have actually taken this on and now of talking about it. Um, can I talk to everybody? Here we go. Um, so that's the webinar there. Oh, actually that's not it, sorry. So this is the webinar that we did um, on um, organizing people with databases. I talk about a lot about ethics there and a little bit about the law. So check that one out um, and watch Digital Rights Watch in Australia because they're now campaigning on stuff. They're running a campaign at the moment to get organizations to sign a pledge on data privacy and data ethics. Like, thank you. Um, this is so needed um, in our community because, um, and I also, on this subject, I would also note, I also um, make a point that I'm very scared at the moment of what's happening in the Australian politics scene. I'm seeing um, all the techniques that the left have developed 
in um, community organising and technology are now being deployed by the right with some very smart people and some big budgets. So I'm seeing different fronts like the Australian Taxpayers Alliance that are um, linked with the IPA and all that sort of dodgy cesspool that are now starting to run campaigns, doing data gathering. Scott Morrison did a really great, um, really great um, campaign where he was asking what Australians think. And we had a lot of lefties that were sharing that and, um, you know, protest Morrison, tell him what you think. And I'm like, don't give them data because the only thing they care about was to how to manipulate you and the data. And that was, that went through so much of my Facebook feed. Um, so there was just this, it was just a brilliant campaign. So liberals have been gathering data directly and they've been um, doing it through fronts. Now the labor have finally figured out how to plug their fax machine into the printer so they can, um, so they're excited. That's where they're at with tech. And the Greens have these things called ethics. And uh, they just don't, aren't doing this dodgy stuff that the Liberals are doing. So um, I'm pretty scared that we've pretty much got, you know, um, the, the power of technology is far siding the Liberal and right side of, of politics. And um, the, the Greens did have a competitive advantage a few years ago for a bit. Um, Adam Bant was just was doing really good work, for example. But yeah, the, it's just getting lost now because they're paying huge technologists huge, huge money. Um, Timber towns do the same technique, movement, local fantasy. Yeah, and I, I, the election's ages away. So like I'm seeing it now, like once, once the election hit, it's gonna be this information um, overload. And the Russian intelligence does this really well. When they get an adversary, basically what they do is they just flood the internet with misinformation about this person and it becomes impossible to find facts. So it just, because I mean, that's, that's what I've seen the liberals are gonna do. They're just gonna like flood social media with misinformation and just really dodgy memes. And then they're also going to elevate really dodgy voices. Um, you know, Pauline Hanson's obvious one, but there'll be a lot of worse ones than her and it's just gonna get gross. Yeah, thanks. Um, now it's just something I wrote um, an article to The Age about uh, quite a few months ago. Um, so I did, a, did, did do a little bit of research on it. Um, basically, the problem starts with the fact that the Privacy Act has a kind of drive-through section for any political party. So the, um, the Act just doesn't apply to uh, political parties. There's a number of other acts that don't apply to political parties too, like the Do Not Call and the Anti-Spam Acts. And I think there's another one as well. I can't remember it. Um, so the, the the issue kind of starts with that. Um, it, uh, what what political parties do is they collect data from the electoral roll, and then they um, they match it against um, the um, oh heavens what they, what's it called these days? You know the old kind of Telstra data. Um, I can't remember what it's called. Um, and um, and then if they're able to pick up your phone number, then they can tell using your phone number whether or not you've moved location because the um, um, the the electoral roll data is updated on a regular basis, and so when people move around, they they want to know that they've got the same person um, in their database, so they use the phone number as a kind of effectively a unique identifier. Um, and then the databases they use are the same databases that you know many of us use. You know, like uh, Nation Builder, which has got a you know reasonably good um, um, customer relations management um, database at the back. And um, then um, I mean, some of us know this quite well. Um, any data that's collected when people are you know calling people or um, uh, doing door knocking or anything like that is is added to it. So it means that the political parties themselves are, are building reasonably sophisticated databases, which is fine when it's your own party, you feel kind of comfortable about that. But when it's um, other parties also collecting data on you and when the that data itself is, I think, relatively unsubjected to any additional laws, um, it's slightly worrying. So um, that's about the limit of my knowledge. Yeah, um, and I also mentioned when when people talk about Facebook selling data, these are the sort of people they sell it to. Yes. So um, then they can. Um, so that's what I mean. Where money is a big key and ethics, because gr the Greens, I assume, um, would just not do that. Um, it's just so unethical and so gross. Whereas liberals are like, give us the money. 
So they'll just buy huge troves of data from um, Facebook and uh, there's other huge private trackers, um, yep. companies that their job is to track you and to sell data. And so um, that's why I'm really frightened at the moment because I'm seeing that the, the, the Liberals are going to be mass buying data. They're gathering their own data. I didn't know about what you just mentioned, Julia, so thanks for that. So they're, they're building this data, massive data engine. And as I said, the, the Labor still get their fax machine to work in their printer. Um, and Greens have ethics. So what we really need is- Greens is nation builder though, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Greens is well, leading this. And then the Liberals like just paid some smart people to just uh, go to them. They were also using um, some of the, I don't know whether they're still doing it, but they were using one of the really, um, oh, I can't remember the name of it now, I'll remember it in a minute. I, I just haven't looked up this stuff for a while. But they were using um, uh, one of the data collection things associated with, um, oh, who's the guy who owns PayPal? I'm not sure. Um, he was working for Trump for a while, um, and yes, it was it was it was what it was the same company that was associated with with the Facebook um, uh, data collection. So the Liberals were using that co that company, but they're not anymore. I don't think I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and so what it allows them to do is psychologically analyse you, um, so that if you look at Cambridge Analytica, which some of those holes have been um, filled up. But that concept is I psych psychologically analyze you. They know you better than you do. They know you better than your, your mum does. Um, and they'll target you specific um, messages based on your fears and your racisms and your other isms and things. Um, and Jules right. It is Peter Thiel and Palantir. He's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what needs to happen is that there needs to be laws simply to stop this. Um, unfortunately, I don't see the Liberals, um, well, the Liberals are weaponizing this. So they're hardly going to ban it. And I would also um, make a, a statement is how can Facebook legally get away with what they're getting away with? And my opinion, this opinion is that it's the ultimate spy machine. And because they're working for the right side of politics, in their opinion, that, that, that then they're like, well, let them do it because it, it benefits the state. Um, the dodgy state, I should say. Um, I mean, really, Facebook should be legal. And I'm really interested why Europe is not... Um, making moves against Facebook. But then you look at the five eyes and the 14 eyes agreements and it's sort of like, well, this sort of makes sense what's happening here. That's an opinion, but um, again, we don't have facts on it. But to me, it, there's enough evidence leading that, you know, they see Facebook as the as such a great tool for their, for their dodginess that there's no way they're gonna make it illegal. These things should, I mean, the fact that Facebook's not illegal is just astounding, like what they do and how they get away with it. And also what the apps do on the phone. How to get a Gmail. Um, can I get a new account at FB with a fake name and get rid of an old one or is there no point? Um, I'll talk about Gmail later um, after the break. We'll have a break in six minutes. -ish. Um, getting an FB with a fake name is really hard now. Um, I tried to do it the other day because I was trying to automate some social media. Um, you need to sync your phone number. Now, as Julia just mentioned, um, uh, the importance of phone numbers, but I'll also mention that phone numbers in Australia are the main tracking ID. So traditionally, like the Greens with their system would be phone uh, would be email addresses. So th this is the, the key record in a um, in a tracking record. But because phones have to have photo ID in Australia, so they the phone's the desperate thing that they want, and um, unfortunately they want to get it. So Google's got my phone number because I had to authenticate use two-factor authentication those sort of things um and i've refused to give facebook my phone number now they've probably got it anyway um but yeah that's a real key, key thing to do so if you want to sign up a new facebook you need to have a phone number with it so um if you go to the point of just getting a new sim sims cost two bucks so you can just set up a new phone number stick it in your phone set up your new um, facebook account um, I do have friends that are running a right winger um, Facebook account. So they, they just like go in there and they join the Bogan groups and they'd be Bogan and they've been Bogan for years. Uh, well, I shouldn't use that word, the uh, uh, redneck or um, racist Aussie or whatever. Um, and so now that when they're sort of, you know, in the context of Stop Adani, they can actually join those groups that are um, the local groups that are, um, you know, that type of people. So, I mean, it is useful. Um, yeah. Um, as far as you personally, um, I've, yeah, I mean, that would be a good tactic is to, to set up a new, 
um, Facebook. Um, I personally have stopped sharing anything personal on my Facebook. Um, I just use it to uh, rant at my friends about politics, basically. So I've got a lot of people unfollow me, but then also people that like a good um, rant and update, and then they get my updates. So even though I, my profile is not public, I sort of treat it as if it is public. Um, but that's no excuse, really. Um, I've got for like Felicity that I mentioned before is just boycotting Facebook. Um, but that's really problematic in this day and age because it's such a key tool to use. Can you request FB to delete your data um, uh, under the laws? I can't speak to fact. My understanding um, is that under the laws that they, they do delete your data. Now I'd be highly skeptical that they do delete your data. Um, I'm not sure, I, I'm just, I just don't trust Facebook in any way, shape or form. Um, and I'd also make assumption that even if they did delete your data, then it would be backed up into another database somewhere, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're nearly break time. Do we have any more questions before break? Because what I want to do, um, yeah, so Julie's going to make another comment on Facebook and data modeling. After the break, I'm going to start talking about tools, stuff that you can do, and then some comments around that. So, you know, we've been talking about theory now, um, and I've got another whole two hours of theory. Um, so if we get bored of the tools, I can jump out of theory, but um, I, just, I want some, some tools that you can start doing stuff rather than just talking about it. Uh, look, this is not something I know an enormous amount about, but I have followed it a little bit. Um, the the so, most of the point of what uh, Facebook collects on you isn't to do with your personal data and what you do from day to day. It's to do with building, with model building. And the model building is based on um, uh, tracking sentiment as much as anything else. Uh, and sentiment is really useful both for selling to advertisers and for selling to governments. Um, so so what, what they're getting is a kind of an aggregate of you. It, so it, this is why de-identifying data is kind of pointless um, because even de-identified data will be used for sentiment modelling. Um, there's, I think, seven character types or something like that. So if you're doing a rant um, and not talking about yourself personally, they'll still be able to pick up the... They'll, they'll be able to do sentiment modelling on, on a rant and they'll be picking up kind of um, general flavours of what different segments of the population are thinking. And um, the way you de-identify data anyway, this comes from Chris Culnane, um, who used to be at Melbourne University, he's just recently moved back to Britain, um, is you just pile data sets on top of data sets until the grid gets so small that, you know, it's pretty much kind of pointing to you and five other people who are just like you. Um, and, um, and, and effectively, you know, Models build up the data and, and kind of disaggregate it, but the more sophisticated the model gets, the more it, it can kind of narrow back down again to pointing at specific groups of people. So they might not be interested in new potential specifically, but they will be interested in, say, what a particular movement is thinking about in general sentiment terms without having the names, if you see what I mean. Yeah, and the more data sets that they have, yep. the more that that works. Um, so which is why like they're tracking me anyway is nonsensical because the less that you can reduce that, even if they're tracking you, like at least you reduce that, the data sets aren't as effective. And just before we break, I'm gonna talk another case scenario that's slightly um, um, related. Um, sorry, I don't have the company off the top of my head, but there's a company, um, I think it was an Australian um, citizen that started it. They basically scanned all of social media um, public photos and then link that to their names and then they built a massive facial recognition database and now they're selling that service to law enforcement around the country including Australian police so the laws around it we either don't have laws or there's not much laws around um, um, facial recognition technology and law enforcement but basically the the police are then going to a private company and just like the laws boy boy according the laws here we go Clearview AI um exactly so that's um, what i'm talking about and so now we have this massive data um, facial recognition database um again it should be illegal but you know the law enforcement are using it so they're turning a blind eye so in that context you know think about that with children when you're their facebook profiles and things like that um and also your own use of um, public photos uh marco's like uh if authorities get your phone number can they track you whether you have changed numbers or changing numbers a pretty secure way to stop them accessing your phone um in that context 
if you uh, do it the Australian way and get a new phone number, you need to provide a you, you know your ID, driver's license, or whatever. So I assume that they'll just be able to track you to phone to phone. So if you want an anonymous um, phone, um, we'll talk about this in a bit uh, in this session. So I'll talk about how to have an anonymous phone and an anonymous data. Um, so yeah, if you're using an official Australian phone, you change your number or you've got your ID linked to it. So that doesn't really help you. Um, what can we do to reduce data matching? Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about that in tools like, um, yeah, so registering different accounts, different email addresses, date of birth. Yep. All that stuff will help. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things that I sign up for and I'm like, you don't need my date of birth. Sure. You may need it to identify my age. So I'll just give them a fake birthday. Like, you just <laughs> like, so yeah, if, if I'm signing up for something like, um, 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 at the doctor surgery, I'll give them my date of birth. Like, okay, like we probably, we might need this in emergency or something, but if I'm signing up to, um, you know, Kazam, I'm not going <laughs> to give them my date of birth. Um, yeah, different email addresses. So one of the concepts um, in tech security is you may have different levels of security. So you may have one email for sort of low security stuff. So, you know, SoundCloud account, which you don't really care about, um, to say you're just a consumer. Um, Whereas if you're a DJ and it's your main asset, then you'd, it would be a more secure um, email or account that you use. Um, yeah, so having different emails does help. Um, and I recommend having a Proton email and I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, every time you register a new SIM in Australia, you need to give ID, driver's license, passport. Um, yeah, so that's um, repeating what I was saying. It is illegal to give false information on this. Um, and I've heard that telcos don't check the details you give. Um, there has been times when we have tried to get anonymous SIMs and generally they're reasonably strict on it. Um, so yeah, but there are other ways of getting around that and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, we're all, all sort of in agreement here that yeah, getting a new phone number through the Australian system is not going to help them not tracking you. Um, but it could help. Uh, well, we're talking about the state in this context. Um, but if we're talking about private, um, oh, my background's gone a bit weird, apologies. If we're talking about private um, trackers, say Facebook, then yeah, changing your phone number will help. So yeah, um, so I'll say no, it won't help to the state, but yes, it will help for, um, for private, for private um, dodgy uh, trackers, if that makes sense. And so th this, this guide here, the second one I'm sharing with you, this is the one which is, talks a lot about concepts and um, you know, working with groups and, and getting agreements and all that sort of stuff. Um, but what we're doing now is actual tools to use. Um, and I, um, there's some really easy stuff. Um, so I'm going to evolve this resource and then I'm going to talk about the concepts and then the tools as one. So I've got a bit of the concepts in both. So. Um, just bear with me. But this was updated yesterday. Um, I also rang up some of uh, my activist friends that are using technology and checked in to see what how the tools are using and that sort of stuff. So this was originally based on expert opinion, but people that weren't using it in the field, and then we've been using it in the field. Um, and it, the great news is that I've had a lot of um, activists now that we debate tools now. And I'm so excited by that because, um, you know, having a little bit of encryption is just far better than having none. Um, it's a uh, real, so, and so I'm so excited that, that the activists care that much to say, well, this is more secure than that. And what about the company that owns it and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, they, this is working on the ground and also prioritize low cost or free tools. Um, because, you know, as activists, you know, we just don't have the big fat budgets. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is just, um, a bit of gaffer tape on your, um, on your, um, camera on your screen because um, there's plenty of um, th there's um, hacking software that can access your camera and switch it on without the light um, and on your phone etc so um, I will always have a little bit of sticky tape um, black sticky tape over my camera and then when I want my camera on I take it off uh, very low tech solution but that does turn off your camera um, unfortunately, we can't do that with a microphone. So I know that some um, security people will actually open their computer, disable, physically remove their microphone, and then um, plug one in. 
I haven't gone to that extent, but if you're, if you're, um, what we will usually do is we'll remove things like laptops and phones if we're having sensitive conversations. Um, and I do that less for the tech, but just more for people to um, take security seriously and start thinking about it. So when we're, we're putting all the phones in the microwave, um, people start to understand we're taking security seriously. Um, yeah. Have Band-Aid on camera now. Um, yep, Band-Aids work. Okay, so um, so take passwords. Now the biggest um, security flaw across the board, without question, is bad passwords. Um, I do a lot of websites and um, the two things that get websites hacked is bad passwords and um, not updating software. And people come to me going, oh, my website's political and I've been hacked. And I'm like, no one cares about your politics. You've been hacked because you've got a dumb password, full stop. Um, there's plenty of guides on writing strong passwords. If you've got a 12 character password, you can get hacked in three hours with current technology. So, um, and there's a website called um, I Have Been Porn. Hang on, let me, I'll just get that up. Sorry, I should put this on the... Now you can put in your email address and it'll tell you whether your email has been, um, has been um, part of a hack. Um, Shadi's just put it up, I'll just put that. Um, so if you use the same password across your systems, you will get hacked. So I'm gonna talk less about theory and more into the tools. So you need a, you need a, a password manager. Um, and so the concept is this is bad, putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, yes, however, having weak passwords and using the same password is far more of a risk. Um, so it's far less of a risk. Now you may also not put all your eggs in one basket. You may have multiple places where you put stuff and things like that. Um, so last pass dash lane, there's heaps of them. So the idea is that you have one really strong password to open it and then that opens up your password wallet. These are actually far more efficient because you get plugins for your, um, yeah, let's let someone in. You can get plugins for your, um, your browser. So when you go to a website, it can automatically log you in. So it's a huge time saver. Um, a low tech version of this is having just a document and then you encrypt that document. But I'd recommend using a password manager because it just helps you log in. Um, this is essential. If you're serious about um, security in any context, you don't have password manager, get one now, uh, this afternoon after the webinar. I mean, it's the, the most important thing. Um, most hacking will just simply guess your dumb password or use a, a, um, something to break into it. So password manager. Now this will take work, not because password managers take work, but you're likely to have a mess everywhere. All your passwords are likely to be messy. You've got to update passwords. It's going to take a bit of work, um, but it's a bit like, you know, all the neighbors in your, in your street have been broken into. And you're looking at your house and like nothing locks and it's all open, like you need to do the work. If you've got like a messy password system, you need to do the work. I mean, there's, um, I can't say that more stringent enough. Saw your passwords, you want long passwords, you want unique passwords, um, and no way your human brain can manage that. There's a few handful of people in the world that might be able to do that, probably not us. So therefore you need a password manager because your brain can't do it. All right. Okay, password manager. Um, okay, so let's just talk about connecting. Um, what's one of the best password managers? I'm using um, Dashlane, I used to use LastPass, I'm moving back to LastPass. Um, there's a few out there. I've got a link there to some reviews. I had a friend that just um, suggested an open source one. Um, that, um, yeah, so there's heaps. The, the point is that you want to question um, its security. So in that case, not that you need to understand encryption, is you do a bit of research and see what the geeks say about it. Um, so for example, uh, LastPass got hacked many years ago, but the the actual independent individual accounts didn't, it was, it was the biggest system and they didn't get into the into the actual encrypted. Da -da -da. Um, so you can do research on these systems, um, but just use one, uh, just use one. Full stop. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about internet connection. So um, Chrome is the most used browser by far, I think they got 80% stats. Now there's a browser um, and I'm um, going off this tool. So if you follow the link that I put in the chat earlier, I'm just gonna stick it right back in there so you can follow what I'm following. 
Um, Brave is Chrome because Chrome's open source. So this is one of the good things that Google's does is that they release their browser open source. That's good because um, you can create your own tools with it, but then you can also order it for security. So you can actually see what Google's doing with that, which is great because if, you know, we can check that they're tracking us through the browser, which all the security experts are saying that they're not, um, for example. But what Brave is, is they've grabbed Chrome and they put ad blockers in. This is key for the data sets that Julie was talking about before. So basically there's a technology called cookies um, and cookies can be useful. So when you log into a website or visit one, they can, they can feed you content that, that you were looking at last time and um, it can do some useful things, but it's used to track you as well. So, so cookies are one of the main things that we want to get around and tracking software. So Brave has all this built in. So all you need to do is install the browser, the same you would install Chrome. And it's the same as Chrome because it is Chrome easy. Okay, so just install Brave. Um, you can install it on your phone and on your laptop. Um, the, the other thing um, is you want to minimize browser plugins. So um, there's some useful plugins. Um, you know, if you're using certain social media, you might have a drop down where you can post it social media straight away. I've got a plugin on mine where I can do a, a full screenshot. So, you know, I'm referencing websites and stuff. Minimize these plugins because each plugin is an independent company that may have its own ethics or non ethics around um, tracking. So, the, some of the companies may produce a really good tool, which is actually a tracker, and then you install a tracker into your thing. So, minimize your plugins. Um, I want you to delete your cookies regularly because the cookies are the tracking things. So, just say you go to Facebook, they give you a tracking cookie, and then um, you've got it for the next three months. Whereas if you um, delete them regularly, they can only start collecting data and then they've got to re keep resetting it. Um, and these cookies are everywhere. Um, and the, we could do a whole workshop on tracking um, and cookies, but I'll leave it at that. So what I do, and I've got the instructions on that page, is you go to Brave and you go up to clear browsing data on the, on the main app, this is on a Mac, um, PC will be similar. You go clear browsing data. So this is your history, your cookies, or your cache. And then there's a, there's a tab that says on exit and you can turn it on. What that will do is when you quit your browser, it deletes all of your history and all of your cookies and cache. So if you quit your browser once a day, they can only collect information on a daily, like if, if you go to a, a website and a tracker starts tracking you, they can track you for a day rather than track you for a month. If that makes sense. So start deleting your cookies. Um, also Google is, is um, a massive spy engine. Now they do some positive things, but they do some very negative things. So, that, so one of the ideas is we really want to, oh, sorry, I've um, sent this to Shay, not to everyone else, sorry. Um, so ideally what we want to do is, is reduce our use of Google. So in my approach, I try to minimize my use of Google completely. Um, so, um, your search data is a really useful thing for Google to be tracking. So start page is a really good alternative. Um, so I've got Jeanette saying, we use DuckDuckGo as a browser. DuckDuckGo is not a browser. DuckDuckGo is a search engine. So I'm recommending start page um, as your search engine. Um, DuckDuckGo is a well respected one as well. I find, um, I find start page is better than DuckDuckGo, but as long as you're not using Google, we're in front. Um, but the browser is the actual tool where you access the internet and then start page or DuckDuckGo is the actual search engine that you use instead of Google. Um, you can also go to your preferences in your browser and you can choose what search engine you use. So when you type it up the top in the bar, you can, so, so I will only ever use Google if Google does something that the other apps don't. So Google Maps, for example, is a little bit more powerful. Um, so I may jump to Google to use the map search only when the other search engines won't help me. So I always use Google as a last resort. But what I did though, what I'm doing is I'm reducing my footprint on Google wherever possible. So yeah, install a browser. It's as easy as installing one. Um, and um, just use start page instead of the Google search. Um, here use map app rather than Google maps. Yep, sure. Um, Open street maps. Um, and Apple Maps as well, also alternatives. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about VPN. Um, so this is called a virtual private network. 
But basically what it does is it connects from your computer to another server somewhere and then you go to the internet there. So generally, um, and this is back to the government mandatory data retention scheme, is that they're tracking the IP, which is the number of your computer. And so when you connect to the internet, you connect to the internet as you, as your IP number, and then that's what the government's tracking for that, that system, and it's what a lot of the tracking systems use. So if you use a VPN, you actually are using someone else's VPN. So that's how simple it is to get around that government tracking um, mandatory data. Um, so you can, um, and most accounts, so this is a paid account, but it's something I do recommend that you pay for and be skeptical of free ones because yeah, the, the ones that you pay for also you're paying for performance because this will slow your internet slightly. So I've been using TorGuard, which is really um, hasn't slowed my internet, um, nor did slow it a bit. Um, both these tools are recommended by um, security experts, but there are heaps of others. Um, it, it, so it's, yeah, I really recommend you get a VPN. Um, you can also have it on your phone. So it just automatically connects to a VPN. So what that will do just in summary is it will change the identifier of your computer to another computer. Now, the other benefit of that is that you can come out at different countries. Just say you want to access some BBC content um, and they've got a block just to um, UK residents, you can actually then use a VPN and then access the internet from the UK. Um, so companies like the BBC will then also block a lot of the um, VPNs. So that's why sometimes it's good to have a more of an obscure VPN rather than a more mainstream one, um, et cetera. So there's some benefits of that. Now, the good thing about VPNs is it's still fast, um, but do beware that your, um, beware that your traffic can still be targeted. So what we're looking at here with a VPN is we're just stopping the automated. Um, if, the, if the security, um, if, if ASIO wants to track you, your VPN is not going to help you um, if they're targeting you. So um, don't think of it as an anonymous access. You're just, it's anonymous in an automated way. Um, but it's not, it's not, in a targeted way, it's not. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about anonymy, anonymous um, searching. Oh, so the next one we're talking about is Tor. So is there any questions on a VPN? Um, is private internet access okay? I'm not sure what that is, so I'm not going to answer it. Private internet access. I assume it's a similar technology. Okay, so Tor, this is a bit more advanced. So I recommend that everyone just gets a VPN. Um, now, Tor is more of an advanced technology um, and you would use Tor over a VPN as well. So you'd use both technologies once. Basically what Tor does is the same thing as a VPN, but it does it many, many, many times. So it does it so many times and because each connection is encrypted that it becomes impossible to work out where, where you came from. So with a VPN, you've got one start and one end. So it's not as hard to work out, you know, where it's coming from. Automated, they can't. Um, but with a tour, it becomes really um, hard to do. Um, now, that gives you pretty good anonymity. Um, and that was, this is the main issue um, that the government's having with um, child sex offences is, is using tour because they're really struggling to crack it. Um, now, the issue with using tour, especially in Australia, is really slower speeds. So it's going to slow your internet down substantially. So it's, it's not as useful for just everyday surfing. Um, but I do recommend, um, and it's not that hard to install. So I do recommend install and, and, and having a go with it. Um, it uses its own browser though. So it won't use Brave. And the reason it uses its own browser is because it's paranoid of those plugins I talked about. And it won't let you install plugins and it keeps it. Now remember, if you're on an anonymous tour, there's still software on your computer, they're still talking the internet. So I've got Adobe installed, and every five minutes, Adobe wants to talk to the Adobe servers. Um, there's other software that wants to talk to the different servers. So if you've got an anonymous connection, but then Adobe's going, Glenn's talking to the server on his account, it's, it's, it, can be, it can be tracked that this is Glenn, right? So um, ideally, if you do want to be anonymous, that you don't use your own computer, or you use a, a secure, operating system. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Or like for Mac, there's a thing called Little Snitch, which um, you can control what connections are going out on your internet. So you just switch everything off. Um, but yeah, just be aware of that. If you are using an, an anonymous system, 
your computer is still probably giving your ID away in other ways. Um, but that's a bit of a learning curve. But um, if you are using Tor, you're going to be far more protected than if you're not, for example. So, you know, it depends on how extreme. Um, the more extreme your security, the more harder it's going to be. Okay, so anonymous connection. So this is how to connect anonymously to the internet. So one way to do it is to use a public Wi-Fi. So you might, you know, go, go sit outside of McDonald's, for example, and use their Wi-Fi. Now, I, I don't like this approach because they're very insecure. And um, if you're connected to a public Wi-Fi, then that's a way for someone else on that Wi-Fi to hack into your computer. Um, anonymous SIM cards. So I've got a link there to an Australian supplier that supplies anonymous SIM cards. So when we were talking to you before, where you um, have to give photo ID to get a phone number in Australia, this gets around it. Or you, um, and I assume this is the way that this SIM card works, is that you can buy an overseas SIM card. So if you find a country that doesn't require photo ID, that has Australian data roaming, that means that you can then order it and then you can put that SIM in your phone and you can switch on um, data roaming and then you probably can't use the phone number, uh, well, probably expensive, but then you can use Signal and all the encrypted things. Um, this is gonna be a bit more expensive for data, of course, because global roaming is more expensive than um, you know, local data. But you know, Australia is expensive anyway, so it might even be cheaper buying it overseas. That takes a bit of um, organizing, but um, that way you can get a phone without a photo ID, um, photo connection. Um, what's the name of this sin? Um, I've got on the link on this, um, I've got the links on this, this page here. Now I've got a, a friend that's one of my security advisors and he does do human right work, uh, human rights work in Papua New Guinea and he's hyper paranoid. Um, he's actually writing some guides at the moment. He's in the process of um, writing guides and um, he's high paranoid about everything. He's critical of everything and he's recommending this supplier. So um, I have a, a, a recommendation, but yeah, you know, you should always be skeptical and, and paranoid of everything. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about your operating system. So your phone, your computer, your Apple, that sort of thing. Because remember when I was talking earlier about the, um, targeting the encryption laws, my opinion is that they're going to target the operating system. So it's really key that you, um, that you think about and manage your operating system, your phone, your laptop. Now, the first thing um, which I don't have on this list is that you should learn a bit more about your tech. Um, so become a little bit nerdy, I know, but I've, most of the issues I see with security are people that, um, won't refuse to learn how their computer works. A lot of it's actually lazy. They just can't be bothered. It's not fun. But here's something that frustrates me. People um, want and expect the benefits of computers. So a lot of the stuff that we're getting like video conferencing and um, being able to organize online and in COVID we're in lockdown and, and computers are really helping us. And you know, computers are revolutionizing the way we're organizing. So they want all these benefits, but they just don't want to do any work for it. They're like, oh, I just want that without any work. Now, I, I really recommend that if you're using technology, anything, you, like if you want to become a good woodworker, you've got to learn the tools, right? So um, I do recommend just the basics of how your computer works. Um, learn, learn how to, um, yeah. So um, I'm not going to give a talk about systems and stuff. I just recommend learn a bit more, become more computer fluent. Now, the real cool thing is you need to update your systems and do the patches regularly because the hackers find holes, the, the software people fix the holes and it's just this loop. So if you've got an old computer, old operating system, there's hacks and there's holes in it and then you can get hacked. So um, you need to update regularly. Now, all modern systems have encryption. Um, all your phones, all your laptops. So switch it on. Back up first before you do. Please back do your backup. But yeah, you should, everything you should have should be encrypted. So all your external drives, all your hard drives, all your computers, everything should be encrypted. That means that, um, and there's a law in Australia, if you don't give them the passwords, you they can um, threaten you with five years jail. 
There's another reason why I think encryption works. But at that point, you have the choice to give them the password or not. Um, whereas if it's not encrypted, they can just access it. Um, so for example, in the US, if you go through the airport, they have the laws where they can just suck all the data out of your computer. Or if you're on public transport, or if you get pulled up by a car, police car, they can just suck all the data out of your phone and, and um, laptop. So if it's encrypted, they can't do that. So then they'll have to take you to court. And it, it, rather than making it easy, you know, you, you're making it as a process. So if everyone in your network's got encryption, then it just makes it far harder. Um, it's also good if it gets in the wrong hands as well. Um, you know, if it's a corporate spy, well, they just can't get access um, and they can't, for, they can't use the law to force it. Um, and I've seen the cases where activists drives that aren't encrypted and it just really scares me. Um, and turn on auto screen lock. So, um, I mean, if you're home with your laptop and your phone, then you don't need it to lock automatically. But if you're leaving the house, you want it so that if it, it locks automatically. Um, for obvious reasons. Um, also, so um, now I'm going to talk about more specific things about phones. Um, these aren't tools, but it's using the tool. That's why it's in this section. So only use location when using location apps. So I have location switched off. And if I want to use um, Google Maps to direct me to where I'm going, I'll switch it on. And when I get to where I'm going, I'll switch it off. Always have your location switched off phone wide, unless you are actively using that app. Um, you want to minimize the amount of apps that you use. Um, because each app is its own little dodgy um, or not dodgy ball of um, security issues. Um, and there's been a huge um, trend in a lot of app developers misusing um, access, gathering data. There's also heaps of examples where companies that are data companies actually create useful apps so that you install it and then they can grab your data. So minimize the amount of data uh, apps you've got. Make sure that you configure the app settings of every app that you've got on your phone because a lot, and when, I promise you when you look in there, you'll be going, why does this app have my location? It's not relevant to um, what I'm using this application for. Um, or it may have a location um, tools, but you're not using them. So switch off location for every single um, app that specifically you don't, you're not using the location for. For example, but then there's other access, like do they need access to your microphone? Do they need access to your context? Do they need access to the hard drive? Fortunately, um, uh, both operating systems, um, Android and Apple are getting better at this, but again, spend some time, have a look at the settings, start switching stuff off. Um, because by default, most things are giving full permission. And sometimes when you're installing an app, it makes you agree to all the things or you can't install it. That's fine, just agree to all the things. But then both Apple and Android have a system to override that. So just agree to all the things, then go to the settings in your Android or um, Apple and then switch them all off again. Um, and if that app doesn't work, using um, uh, permissions that it doesn't need, then I'd be highly suspicious of that app. So for example, if it's an app like, uh, so Instagram, for example, um, I give it access to my, my um, files because I've got photos on it, my photos, but then I turn location off. Yes, it's a useful tool for some people, but if that app didn't work with that location, I'd be super um, paranoid of it. Um, do not install Facebook or Facebook Messenger or TikTok uh, on your phone at all. Just don't install it. Um, so the Facebook app and Facebook Messenger, um, there's heaps of um, information go online um, of it being really dodgy spyware. Um, it accesses stuff that it shouldn't. It does stuff with that access it shouldn't. Um, just don't use it. Um, I always use my Facebook via a browser. Um, so, because browsers um, also have their own security and they, they, they're really tight and you can tighten your browser software. So by looking at Facebook on your browser, you're really putting it in a sandbox, basically. You're really restricting what it can do. Now, Facebook's dodgy. And again, this thing here should be illegal. And again, back to my point, I think it's um, illegal for a reason. Is that if you're on a phone and you're looking at Facebook Messenger on your um, browser, it will force you to load the app. I mean, how can this be legal? 
But what you can do is you can go to mbasic.facebook. And what mbasic was designed for is uh, in remote countries in Africa where the internet was crap, Facebook still wanted to get uh, market penetration to these areas. So they've created mbasic, which is a really low fi version of Facebook. This allows you to access your messages on a browser. So you can get around that really dodgy thing that Facebook does is try to access, try to get you to the app. Um, and it was mentioned on the comments, but facial recognition lock and um, fingerprint lock can be unlocked by cops. So if you get arrested with your phone, they just put the phone up against your face and it opens the phone. <laughs> like they've got your face, your face is under arrest. And your finger's under arrest as well. In fact, if you're under arrest, they can take fingerprints, of, they can take copies and put it in your database. So they just stick your finger on the phone and then they open the phone. So if you're going out, of the, um, if you're going to, well, I recommend not using those technologies anyway, but if you are uh, using them, then definitely switch them off if you're going to a protest or um, that sort of environment. Um, older phones have lots of vulnerabilities. So if your phone can't run the latest operating system, then it's insecure. Now this sort of breaks my heart a bit because I'm an environmentalist and I'm really into minimal, minimal and like less resources and we shouldn't waste resources. And now this is an issue of the phone companies, um, but the reality is that if you've got a phone that can't run the latest operating system, then it's vulnerable. Um, okay, specifically on your PC and Mac, um, viruses and anti-malware. Um, also for Mac, because Macs can get targeted. Um, there's two examples that are quite expensive. The AGV one's free. Um, so yeah, you, I would leave it at that, but I recommend doing your own research and also making sure you're scanning and um, your computer for viruses and malware. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna talk about is more advanced. This is for the advanced users. Um, this is a, what we call a secure operating system. So Tails um, grab Linux, which is the most secure operating system by far. Like Linux is far more secure than Apple or um, Windows. Um, but what they've done is the geeks have then tightened it even more and tightened it and tightened it and tightened it. So it's one of the most secure systems there. What you can do is you can install that in a USB key. So you can stick it into your Mac or Windows and you can boot Linux off that. So therefore, um, you're no longer running your system, which you know has Adobe is talking to the um, server that I was talking about before. Um, and then you're running an anonymous um, operating system. And therefore, if you've got an anonymous internet connection and an anonymous um, operating system, and then you're using Tor, then that is pretty, pretty secure, pretty private. Um, and for, you know, and you don't need to be that technical to get to this point. The problem with Tails is you'll need to learn a little bit about just how the operating system works. You know, it's like if you're going from Mac and you gotta learn Windows, it's sort of, well, you'll need to learn a little bit about Linux, but Linux is getting a lot friend friendlier. Um, but yeah, um, it's definitely within the reach of normal people, um, but it will, will take a little bit more work. But if you want, actually wanna be anonymous, um, like proper, then um, that is one of the ways of doing it. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about phone communications. Because we're all using our phones to communicate. So one of the most important things that I'd say is anything that's encrypted is better. So um, WhatsApp is um, owned by Facebook. Um, it's got a bit of criticism, but I reckon WhatsApp is far more secure than SMS. If, um, if WhatsApp's the best you can do, then well done. Like, well done, you, you, you're now got encrypted in, um, communications. Um, definitely not being sarcastic. So yeah, any encryption is better. Um, so SMS and voice, uh, what we know as the default phones, um, was designed and built to be recorded and intercepted. Um, back to the Telegram days when they were using Morse code, they had, they, that was built with the, with the intelligence community way back then. Like it's, it's just built to wiretap. So anything that, that goes over and um, not using SMS or phone is just massive. So stop using SMS, stop using voice on the phone. Um, especially like even with your mom. So if you're, if you're like um, able to get your, um, your, your non-activist friends or your, or like your parents and stuff on this, that means that when you are doing a secret squirrel phone call, it's, it's lost. Remember that, um, 
needle in a haystack. If you're only using encryption to talk to your um, collaborators, then that's easier to target. Whereas if you're using encryption for everything. So I'm fortunate now that nearly 80% of all my SMSs are going through Signal. Because just because my friends um, just don't want to be spied on. Like, it's not that they're doing anything at all. They've got nothing to hide as well, but they just don't be spied on. And also if you're flirting with your partner, like really, do you want ASIO to know about that? Um, and also of um, my brother-in-law, um, he impresses me because um, every time they do family chats, they're always using encrypted methods. Um, and he doesn't post anything about his young son on any public um, channels. They've got the, an encrypted thing system, um, which is designed for families and babies. And then like only family members can log in and see all the photos of their children rather than posting it to Facebook. Um, okay, so Signal is the recommended one. Um, that uh, basically um, is respected by all security experts. The problem with Signal is it's not anonymous because it still syncs to your phone number. So there's still a little bit of metadata leak there. But there is a version of Signal, um, sorry, I don't have off to my head. Um, I can, I'll add it to the, the um, notes when I, when I update this after this. Um, but Signal is easy to use. Um, it is as easy to use as um, SMS. Like you just install Signal, it works. So it's that easy. So please install Signal, get your friends to install Signal. There's other apps like Telegram, WhatsApp, et cetera, et cetera. As I said, anything encrypted is better. So if all your friends are using um, Telegram, sure, use Telegram. Um, but yeah, and also Signal is great because I've got a desktop version. So that means that while I'm working on my computer, instead of having to type on a phone, I can type on my um, keyboard. Um, encrypted chat um, for Signal that doesn't use phone numbers. Yeah, so here's, here's a fork called Get Session. I think that's the one I was talking about, um, which doesn't need phone numbers. Um, but there's a few few apps out there now. Um, but yeah, just get rid of SMS, stop using it. Um, and also Signal does voice, it does video calls. So yeah, just get rid of your phone, phone default phone. So to me, um, I look at my phone as no longer a phone. I look at my phone as a computer that has internet connection. And then I use voice apps and I use um, SMS apps, I mean, sorry, um, messaging apps. Um, I see a phone uh, as, as a fax machine. They're just, they're just um, superseded. Um, okay, so email. Um, email, um, we mentioned before, um, there's a, there's a te technology called PGP, pretty good privacy, um, that's best practice. Um, it's just hugely complex. Um, Shay mentioned before he struggled with it, I struggled with it, and I don't trust that normal people can actually figure it out and it's secure. So um, the great news is there's an organization called Proton Mail has come out. Um, that's um, in one of the Nordic countries. It's encrypted end to end and it's also encrypted so they can't access the data. This is, um, so that me and their accounts are free. So it's only encrypted Proton to Proton. So if you send from Gmail to Proton, then it's not encrypted. Because you know Gmail isn't, and therefore it's it's. Um, so I recommend everyone just shift to ProtonMail, um, and it's a good tool. It's got a um, you can the paid version you can sync to um, Outlook, Mozilla, Fire, Thunderbird, Apple Mail, all those sort of things. And my paid version, I'm I'm able to use my own domain, but the free version um, works really well. So um, ProtonMail, burner phones, and again. This breaks my heart because I believe in minimal tech resources and the tech industry is horrible for child exploitation and mining and pollution and gross stuff. Um, but if you're doing, if your phone has so much information on you, so if you are going to a protest or something like that, it does make sense to have a separate phone. That way you can maybe be a little bit looser with your security um, work on your main phone tighten it up of course, but what level, but then you could have another phone that's tight as and just hasn't got anything on it. Um, you can buy a cheap secondhand one, but ensure they run the latest OS. Um, and there's another link to the same place that does the um, SMS, uh, sorry, the, the SIM cards. They, um, they have encrypted, hearted and privacy focused smartphones. They're pretty expensive, um, but they're like phones that are, so if you've got two people using them phones, then they're super secure. I mean, yeah. 
But the easiest way is just to get a second hand phone, cheap phone and um, follow the things I've talked about before. And in that context, just don't put any data on it. The other thing you want to do is if you are using a burner phone is that you um, don't use it at your house. So if you at all, you don't turn it on near your house. Um, so because if you're using it at your house and it can be location tracked. So um, there's two ways to track location. One is obviously the location services, GPS, that's obvious. The other way to do it is to what they call triangulation. So say you've got three phone towers in your area. Oh, I'm in the screen, there three phone towers. And then what they do is they triangulate the signal strength between the three of them. And um, then they can work out where you are. It's not as accurate as GPS. And GPS works the same way as well, actually. It's um, the distance, um, the, the distance between satellites, um, super fine, um, really um, Pacific technology. So even if you got GPS switched off, if you're connected to phone towers, they can still triangulate your location. Um, but that does restrict it to the state and Telstra versus if you've, you know, you're giving it your GPS location to Google and every other company. Um, but do be aware that even with location switched off, your phone is still tracking you. So um, don't switch it on near your house and that sort of stuff. All right, any questions on that? So I'm hoping that list I went through, besides tails, um, all that stuff you should just be able to go and do after this session. And you're really gonna tie up your security heaps. It shouldn't take you long, and then you can encourage your friends to do it. And this is gonna be massive impact on security of you, and also of all the other people out there. So yeah, please do that. Hopefully there's stuff simple. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about collaboration, you know, working with other people. Um, which is what we do. We're organising against the state and the corporations to save the planet and to have a better, better um, everything. All right. So Slack, Google, all those tools, not encrypted. Um, so Google is the best collaborative tool on the planet without question. It's, it's awesome. And Slack's awesome as well. I use the tools. I love them. Um, if you're using Google and Slack, it's pretty much the best, best system known at the moment. Now, the problem is they're not encrypted. They're encrypted in transit, so um, it stops um, people trying to, you know, connect your messages while they're getting sent on the um, internet, but they're not encrypted where it's stored. That means authorities can request access. So, um, and they're legal companies, so Google Australia, although they don't pay tax here, they um, still under Australian law. So that means Australian authorities under Australian law can give a warrant to Google and they will give you all the information requested. Um, same in the US, whatever. So in that case, they could also, um, so pretty much anything you're using on Google and Slack is accessed by the, by law enforcement. Um, and Google itself is, is scary. The data that they're building is unethical. Um, the, the, the databases and what they're building and learning about us is simply unethical. So um, I pretty much minimize my use of Google completely. Um, also, if you delete messages on Slack um, and you delete messages on Google, like does that actually delete it off their backups? Have you actually deleted that information? Can law enforcement still access deleted information? Um, VoIP tools like Skype, Google Hangouts have wiretapping capabilities built in. So you may remember Skype, um, that got bought out by Microsoft and Microsoft was one of the first tech companies to work directly with the um, intelligence community. Um, and also Microsoft has massive military cont um, contracts. So like um, Microsoft is part of this US spy engine. Um, yeah, so bear that in mind with any collaborative tools. Um, so one of the best systems, and this is what um, Extinction Rebellion are using, is Nextcloud. So Nextcloud is pretty much an equivalent to um, Google Drive. So it's got the videos, it's got, it's got the mess email, it's got calendar, it's got video chat, it's got collaborative documents. Now, as I said, there is no tool that is as good as Google, but it's, it's pretty close. Um, now the thing is, there's two things about Nextcloud. One is also, you, it's open source, but you can also host it where you want. So that means that if you go, oh, I'm, I'm gonna host it in Iceland where it's really safe and I'm gonna encrypt it, et cetera, et cetera. Now that requires some geek um, knowledge. So this is a little bit more advanced, but I'm putting it up there because it's the best case for, um, especially if you're an organization that does have some budget um, 
and I'm looking at, you know, um, if you're a, um, a community legal organization or, um, you know, any sort of organization that has some budget, you should be spending the money, all right? So um, now there's a, the same company that's selling those SIM cards and the phones also um, sell a hosted NextCloud um, in-store. So that means you pay them a monthly fee and they manage it for you. And there are other um, ways of doing it. So um, I do recommend that you consider that. And as I mentioned, um, Extinction Rebellion, the UK has a really active tech collective. And um, if you're in Extinction Rebellion, actually they, they have got their own hosting environment and they will supply your local um, Extinction Rebellion group with a next cloud install. Um, and that's sort of how they're having digital um, security in their systems. But you can do it your way or you can do it, um, pay someone else to help you with it. All right, so now the next bit is assuming that you're not using that system and there's different, or there's different bits and pieces. You don't need a full suite, you just want a few different bits and pieces. Um, group chat. This is actually something that sounds simple, um, but it's been hugely hard for us on the ground. Um, and I explained some of the issues we had. So um, Matrix Riot was recommended by the geeks as being best case scenario. The problem is that they had all these authentication errors regularly. So normal people just stopped using, it was just too hard to use. It was, and this is just a simple chat program. The problem with Signal using in a group is that I want to replace my Signal with my SMS. And if I'm getting all these notifications from all these groups, it becomes unusable as SMS. So we don't want to really use signal like that. So if you've got a small group, sure, but it doesn't work on a large group. Um, now Keybase is what we've been using, it's been really good. Um, so this gives you encrypted um, group chat. Now they've also brought in file sharing, um, which, um, sorry, I've got there in my notes similar to Slack, that should read similar to Sync. Um, so that means you can store documents, you can collaborate on documents in your chat. And so that's really exciting. We've finally got really good tools we can use and then Zoom comes and buys them. Uh, and so I was like, oh, that sucks so bad because we don't trust Zoom. Um, so yeah, um, at the moment, it's still best case. And again, as I said, using some encryptions better than none. So um, there's a tool called Cephamore and um, we tested this um, a couple years back and it was just buggy and didn't work well. They've got a new version and they've also got a free version. So I'm keen to give that a go now. Um, so that's for your encrypted group chat. Video conferencing. So Zoom, um, we started using Zoom for two reasons. One is it was encrypted end to end. And two, it just works the best. This is the same as Google. You know, Google just works the best. Um, Zoom works the best. And I'm talking about with Frontline Action on Call, we had people in remote Queensland. We had people with really dodgy internet connections and that stuff. Zoom just worked better on the field. Now the issue is the encryption is only for paid users. So you need a paid account of Zoom, like the one I'm using now. Um, and it needs to be switched on. And Zoom openly said uh, recently that they, they will not make the free version encrypted because it allows them to work with law enforcement. So basically, unless you pay them, they're gonna hand over data to law enforcement. Um, they also said publicly that they've been working with the Chinese authorities to um, stop activists using Zoom. So at that point, Zoom sucks. Um, there's a bit of a boycott campaign at the moment, um, but we've got to balance it. It's like it's the best tool, um, it sucks. Um, so uh, yeah, we're in a bit of a sticky about that. Um, what will happen in the future, there'll be just a better tool that will happen. So um, the thing with security is sometimes you need to make compromises. Um, yeah, and I'm making a compromise now, but I do, it's also important to acknowledge it though. If you are using these tools and you're not comfortable with them, at least tell everyone that, like I'm telling you now, like, and I introduced this, this, this um, meeting with, I'm using this tool because for this reason, but then I'm, I'm not happy with it for this reason, just so that you understand. Um, I think consent's really important. Even if you pay them, they will hand over your data, but if it's fully equipment, there's less, yeah, less to hand over. Um, okay, so Jitsi is good. I was about to mention that. Um, set up your own instant locally. Um, 
I disagree that Jitsi is good because, um, and I've talked to a lot of activists and it's just unstable. Um, so if you're able to use it, then definitely use Jitsi. Jitsi is open source um, and it's encrypted. So Jitsi is the best, best um, ethical use, uh, best theor theoretical use. So what I recommend is use Jitsi first and then only not use it if you've got problems. And so in our context, um, you know, we, we can't get Jitsi to work in remote Queensland, for example. Um, Zoom is talking about now giving encryption to free customers, but you have to give them an ID. Yeah. So I, I'm looking for a replacement for Zoom. I think Zoom is the same as Microsoft. They've just now put their cards on the table and they're, they're not for the people. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at, so and that's interesting because I started using Zoom because I refused to use Skype because it was bought by Microsoft. So it's just a bit of a loop, right? Um, and that's really upsetting that they've bought Keybase because we're using Keybase because it's the best around and then it gets bought. Same with um, WhatsApp was actually a really good software and then Facebook bought it. But you know, that's why it's important to just keep your ears open and which is why I'm always updating the guides because these things just change. Um, we're learning all the time, things are evolving, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so Apple, as much as they're also um, as dodgy as Google, they do actually um, really champion encryption. So Apple in this in, in environment is in our good books. They literally took the FBI to court. We talked about that earlier. Um, and a lot of security geeks um, uh, do recommend Apple phones as more secure than, hey, I'm trying to admit someone into the room, um, is more secure than Android. Um, I'm, I don't have that experience, uh, expertise to comment, um, but uh, uh, FaceTime, which is um, video conferencing, is um, being recommended by security experts. You can have up to 32 people in a FaceTime meeting. However, you only can use Apple products to use FaceTime. So if I'm a community organizer, that just isn't an option because um, you know, I don't want to say, well, you need an Apple to be able to come to a meeting. It's just, but if you've already got an environment where everyone has apples, just by coincidence, then that is a really good option. Um, and we're looking for a better option. Um, and I'm a bit over time. Um, so I'm gonna, we're getting close to finishing. Um, so I'm gonna go a little bit over time, apologies. Um, and Signal is also good for one-on-one -on -one video. All right, so file sharing. Oh yeah, we're nearly there. So file sharing, um, this is the same as Google Drive and Dropbox. Now, Google Drive and Dropbox aren't encrypted. Same thing, government can access it, dodgy, whatever. Um, and there's a link to a transparency report which reveals the number of warrants presented. So some of the companies like Google and Dropbox are now publicly um, declaring how many warrants, then obviously it's a bit like metadata, right? They're not telling what's in the warrant, but they're at least reporting on numbers. So we can have an idea of just how much the intelligence community, or not the intelligence, because they've got different laws, but the, um, the federal and state police are accessing these systems. All right, so file sharing. Keybase, um, as mentioned, um, working really well in the field. Sync is um, a version of Dropbox that's encrypted. There's a free version of both of these. Spider Oak is um, an option, and I think that's a paid paid tool. Um, and Onion Share I haven't used, but it's been recommended by some geeks um, that operates over the Tor network. So this is far more secret squirrel um, using Onion Share. All right, so document collaboration. So this is one of the key issues that we have with, um, with Google Drive is it's so good at collaborative documents. Um, and you, I'm sure you've all used it. Um, the closest we've got to that is called CryptPad. Um, that allows real-time um, collaboration editing on a document and it's encrypted and et cetera. Um, I've also been in a meeting where um, that they use CryptPad as the chat in the meeting. So this was um, a few years ago where before the chat programs were too hard, like they literally opened up CryptPad and then started typing the conversation. Um, so yeah, CryptPad's been used quite a lot in the, in, in the community. So the big issue with, um, um, yeah, so pad.riseup I think is using the same technology. And the thing with CryptPad is that it's open source. So you can install your own version of it on your servers. Um, so the issue with CryptPad is managing your documents because in Google Drive, you just go to Google Drive and all your documents are there. Um, so that's one of the challenges. So one thing you could do is just have hyperlinks on a document to your CryptPad docs, and then you have it in your file sharing, encrypted file sharing like sync.
So you may have a document in sync that then has links to all your CryptPad documents. Um, so this is a little bit more work, um, but do remember that Google Documents is accessible to the authorities. Um, another way I've seen people use this is um, using a text desktop text editor or a document editor, Microsoft Word or OpenOffice, and then they type and then they encrypt it, put it on a shared drive. That's not real-time collaboration, but if, if your team are working at different time periods, then that's an option. Um, and then I'm also, don't have on the news side, this is uh, two-factor authentication. So this is really key um, technology to use. So basically what it just means is there's two, you need two ways to get into your account. So one way is username and password. The second one could be an SMS. Um, so SMS is the least secure of them all because obviously the state can access that. Um, however, it's, it's exponentially better than not having two-factor. So as I said, any, uh, with encryption, any encryption is better than none. Any two-factor is better than none. Um, so a lot of um, companies are now using email two-factor. So when you go to log in, they email you a code and then you've got to put a code in. Um, so a lot of companies now are forcing you to do this, but you can set your own up. There's various apps, um, Google Authenticator. And although it's by Google, it's also been um, okay by security experts. Um, 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 and then there's um, also um, lots of a few other approaches for um, doing two-factor authentication. So again, depending on your, your security level. So for example, your bank, you should just switch it on um, because if someone accesses your bank, so all of your really important accounts, you just switch on two-factor authentication. Um, if it's again, your SoundCloud account, you don't, and yeah, I don't care if someone hacks it, um, but you know, do you care if someone hacks your Facebook account, then put two-factor authentication on it. Um, there's a few methods, um, but yeah, um, Shay's saying I like Authy for two-factor authentication, and I've also been recommended that. Um, I'm using Google Authenticator, and also with, say, Bendigo Bank, they give you, they, there's a tool that they use, like, so you have to use the one that they choose. So yeah, if you can turn on two-factor authentication for anything that's important, then turn it on. Any questions? So I'm hoping that on this list, nearly most of it, you can now replace most of what you're doing and get rid of Google and um, get rid of the trackers and install encryption. And um, I will make one last comment about the yellow belt um, approach to training. And um, what this means is like, if you're teaching white belts, you don't need to be a black belt to teach a white belt. I'm talking about karate analogy or martial arts analogy. You only need to be, um, you only need to know more than the white belt. So if you're a yellow belt, you know more than the white belt, you can teach them the basics. So right now, you know enough to be a security trainer. You've got enough. You've got, I've got, you've got the resources. You know the basic concepts. You're about to install the tech. So right, so I really encourage you now that you're you are a, you're a security expert. You should be training people, and you should be spreading this technology because it works better at scale. And you'll notice I didn't do it, go through anything that technical today as far as algorithms and stuff. So um, hopefully you're at my level now. So the, so please share. Have a wonderful day.